Well, good morning. You might open your Bibles to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 will begin there this morning. It's good to see everybody here. Uh, we do have some visiting with us. We certainly appreciate your presence this morning. We'd love for you to take a moment afterward and let us shake your hand and get to know you a little bit better. It's good to see our number here. It's like just about everybody's here. We've got a couple that are out of town and not feeling well, but other than that, we've got most of our people, and that's certainly good, good to see I'm going to talk about faith this morning, but I want to talk about faith in a particular context. And I think it's a context that we're all going to experience. It's a way of something that's going to occur in all of our life. But I think before we talk about it, we've got to talk a little bit about what faith is. And I think it's important for us as we talk about faith, if we're going to use faith in a biblical sense, and I want to stress that, if we're going to use faith in a biblical sense, we're not talking about some facts that we have accumulated. We're not even talking about in a biblical sense just what you believe to be true. And we're certainly talking about something more than a feeling that you may or may not have. As a matter of fact, I think Romans chapter 4 is a great place to go to begin understanding this concept of biblical faith. And I think we'll see something a little different than is often uh, found by some in Romans chapter 4. But I want you to begin reading with me in verse 11. Speaking of Abraham, it says, He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. And the father of circumcision to those who were not only of the circumcision, but who also listen to this, follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. You know, if I don't get anything else out of Romans chapter 4, there's this interesting figure of speech following in the steps of the faith of Abraham that tell me something about faith. It includes some sort of participation. You know, if what Paul means to say in Romans chapter 4 is that faith is purely internal, that faith is just the way I look at the world, that faith is just having some sort of inactive trust in God, that I can have faith apart from obedience, he sure picked a strange way to say that in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. I think he picked a strange example talking about Abraham and the life that he lived before and after circumcision. Because what we see in Abraham is an active participation in a relationship with God. And it was based on faith. As a matter of fact, I think you could say, and I'm using a New Testament term to describe an Old Testament character, I understand that. But in principle, what you see with Abraham is faith driving him to a form of discipleship. He's following after God. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8 would tell us, by faith Abraham went out. And what is that talking about? He left the land of Ur. He left the land of his father. And he went to the place that God said he would show him. Abraham did that because he trusted in God. But that trust was manifested in action. It changed the course of his life. Because he had faith. And faith leads to hope. As a matter of fact, that's where Romans chapter 4 ends. Abraham had been made these promises. None of them could come true until and unless he had a child. Isaac was to be the child of promise. And Paul talks about how it is that Isaac came into the world. Verse 18, in hope, against hope, he believed. There's Abraham's faith. In hope against hope he believed so that he might become the father of many nations according to what, what that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Look at verse 19. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. He grew strong in faith. And being fully assured that what God had promised, He was able to perform. Therefore, it was also accredited to Him 
as righteousness. We understand the situation here. Abraham's about 100 years old. Sarah's not far behind him. She's never been able to have children. That's been an issue in their marriage the whole time as you read through the Genesis story. And yet God comes and says, I'm going to give you this child. And Abraham believes. Is that all Abraham did? I hear a lot of people coming to this passage and saying that Abraham had faith, but but it does not talk about obedience. The brethren, do we have to be explained what's going on there in verse 19? Isaac was not conceived immaculately. Something had to be done. Abraham trusted in God. He, he carried out the action that was necessary. His hope, driven by his faith, led him to this obedience. As a matter of fact, I would suggest to you that it is hard to open up any Bible passage that deals with faith and not find obedience, not find action, not find the man who is attributed, to whom faith is attributed, doing something in response to God and God's Word. The two are almost inseparable, especially in Romans and in Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is essential. We understand that. We know that. Faith is more than what we might think it is at first. It's something that requires action on our part. I want to talk about faith this morning, though, in the context of discouragement. I believe with all my heart that discouragement has the potential to derail our faith. I don't necessarily mean that because I got discouraged, I quit believing that there is a God. That's not the idea that I want to deal with this morning. More the idea that a series of discouragements a lifetime of discouragements may derail my service to God. It may dull my hope. I may cease to follow after God actively. It may even hamper my obedience to direct commandments that God has given us. That's a terrible thing to think about, but I believe it's true. And if you've been alive very long, if you've been a Christian very long, You probably know of examples of this happening. You've probably seen this happen in people's lives. And here's the thing about it. Discouragement can come in a lot of different forms. You know, the source of my discouragement might be me. It might be that I'm dealing with a series of shortcomings and and the more I look at my own faults, the more discouraged I become. It could be that there's some sin in my life and I... I just keep struggling and falling to the same sin over and over and over. And maybe because of that, I just decide, this is too hard. I'm just not getting it done. I'm going to stop. Discouragement could be the result of hard times. Trials. Difficulties that we experience as those begin to mount up over the years until we just become dull. The flame goes out. And our faith is devastated. Sometimes it's another Christian, isn't it? How many of you have been in that situation where there's someone in the Lord's church that you admire? Maybe you look up to them. Maybe you're very close to them. And the world gets them. And you see them depart. That that can have a terribly negative impact on our life. The disappointment that that can bring. We thought they were this and maybe they were, but now they're not. What does that say about me? What does that say about the Lord? What does that say about serving Him? What does that say about my faith? And if we're not careful, that can take us to a very dangerous and a very dark place. And so the question we're going to try to deal with this morning in the little bit of time that we have, is how do I demonstrate faith even in times of discouragement? When I am down, what is faith calling me to do? And how do I ensure that my faith is not destroyed? I'm going to put three things up on this board behind me here in just a second. And I want you to know that I realize what you're going to think when you see them. You're going to hope right now that there's going to be something profound that's going to pop up on the chart and that it's going to be life-changing, that you've never thought about it, and you're going to think that's so deep and so wonderful because that's what we all want from every sermon. 
how often are you disappointed? That's not what's going to come up on that chart. As a matter of fact, you're probably going to go, that's it? You may think that's the most cliche thing that Sean could have put on the board this morning. You're probably going to be right. At first glance, it's going to look shallow. I understand that. I think it's because of the way we talk about the things I'm about to put up on the board here. I think it's because of the way we treat those things. I think they became cliche because they're the truth. And yet what we do with truth so often is we slice layers away from it until it becomes so thin that we think it doesn't have power, and so we want a different answer. But that usually doesn't work. I think sometimes all we can do is kind of kind of stick with the basics. What do I do for my faith when I'm in discouraging times? Well, I want to tell you to keep pressing on. Oh, nobody's ever told you that, have you? Keep pushing forward. I want to tell you to discipline your thoughts because no one's ever mentioned that to you, have they? But I think that's exactly what we've got to do is we've got to discipline our thoughts and then we've got to surround ourselves with the right people. I told you there's nothing special coming up on this chart. You've heard all of these things since you were a small child. If you've made it through your teenage years, I guarantee you someone has said all of these things to you numerous times. The question isn't what are these things. The question is why are these the things we keep hearing? What I think we can do this morning is take these ideas to some biblical examples that I think we can find connection with very easily. And I think we can begin understanding these things maybe in a more profound, deeper way and see in them the truth that we need in order to press on in our faith. And so that's where I want to begin is with this very idea of pressing on. But I want to explain what I mean by that first. Because I'm afraid that what we do with that phrase or that concept of pressing on is we substitute it with another phrase we hear all of our life And that is, fake it till you make it. How many of you have ever said that? I know I have. I used to think it was good advice. I don't anymore. I really don't. Especially not when we're talking about things like our faith and how we deal with life. Now, is there an application of that fake it till you make it concept? There is. You know, if you're going through the early stages of any sort of training, that may be the only way to make it through. You know, maybe, maybe physically you've decided it's time to go back to the gym and you haven't been in a long time, maybe never. Let me tell you something, that first week stinks, right? I mean, you wake up on day three and you hurt places you didn't know you had, right? And why would you go back on day four and pretend like you want to be there? Well, you're going to have to kind of fake it, right? But there's kind of a linear progression with that, isn't there? You know, you know if I make it through week two, I'm going to be honest, the last time I did this I was in my 40s, it took for week five, but, but we'll, we'll forget about that. If I can just make it to a, a certain point, then that pain will kind of go away or at least lessen dr- dramatically, and I'll start to experience the benefit. And so what we're telling ourselves is, all I've got to do is just keep climbing, keep climbing, keep climbing, and then I'll get there and everything will be better. And there are a few instances in life where that's true and where that works, but they're very, very few, aren't they? Because that life is not a linear progression, is it? Life doesn't just move from a period of pain to a period of success, from failure to success, from pain to ease, from trial to no difficulty. That's not how life works. Life is a lot more like standing on the beach and watching those waves come in, isn't it? And every crest is a trial and every trough is a, is a period of, of, somewhat, of some sort of ease. But if you stand on that beach long enough, some waves are bigger than others. Sometimes they come in faster. Sometimes they come in slower. There, there's a randomness to it. The only thing you know is that whatever you just saw is about to change. To me, that's a lot more realistic when we think about life and what life is. So this idea that I can fake it till I make it, a bunch of nonsense that's not going to work. Instead, what I need to do is to learn how to live by faith. Someone says there's another slogan, Sean. You're really into these cliche things this morning. Well, that's only a slogan if I make it one. You know the story of Genesis 12 as well as I do. 
God comes to Abraham. He makes Abraham three promises, doesn't he? Abraham, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to make of you a great nation. And all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through you. And from that day forward in Abraham's life, what we see is a consistent pattern of Abraham living by these promises. He leaves Ur of the Chaldees based on these promises. And essentially, everything we do, or everything we see Abraham do in the Genesis account has something to do with these promises. Now, sometimes he takes the wrong path. There's no doubt about that. But even then, it's about those promises if you really sit down and think about what's going on in Abraham's life. He was a man who lived according to a promise. But you know what? He still had some difficulties. He still endured many trials. Twice he was placed in the power of foreign kings that threatened these very promises, right? That's what's going on with Pharaoh and with Abimelech. And I think that's why Abraham did what he did. Abraham sees his wife. He sees this king. The king sees Sarah. Sarah's a beautiful woman, but she's barren. Maybe this is God's way of finding me a new wife through whom to bring about the promise. God makes it real plain for Abraham the second time, doesn't he? Abimelech takes Sarah. God shuts the womb of every female creature in the land. Why? Why? Because he was going to bring Isaac through Sarah. And there was going to be no doubt that this was Abraham's child, not Abimelech. And you know, after that, you see Abraham really buckling down and really moving toward that promise. But all throughout the Genesis account is a promise. These three promises that depend on a child, his wife is barren. He lives in a land that's filled with turmoil and danger. Think about Lot's captivity. You're going to give me this land. Five kings just came and walked right in here to two of the biggest cities in the land and took my nephew. What security do I have in this land? Opportunity after opportunity after opportunity for him to become discouraged, for him to go back to earth, for him to say, God, you know, the promise sounds great, but I'm pretty rich as it is. And, and I could just go and forget about this promise and be a really, really rich shepherd and not have to deal with a lot of this nonsense. Abraham doesn't do any of that, and he doesn't do that because he's focused on the promise. You and I today, as Christians, we live a promise-based life. You ever think about it that way? This is Paul's point in Philippians chapter 3, and there in verse 20 when he talks about our citizenship, and he tells us that we're not citizens here. Our citizenship is somewhere else. He's talking to us about the promise of heaven. Now what you and I would like, we would like some linear path from here to there, wouldn't we? We would love it if we came out of the waters of baptism and day by day by day everything got easier and our discouragements faded away and, and we came closer and closer in some visible way to that promise. But that's not what God said He was going to do. I think sometimes that's what we think we heard. I, I think we get in Affected with this health and wealth garbage that's being put out by the megachurch world. It's about the most unbiblical thing you could possibly try to teach out of the Bible. I think we get a little caught up in that even if we don't take it wholeheartedly. And, and we get a little mad when, when things don't go well. And we want to say to God, I'm being faithful to you. Kind of like Abraham. Or Joseph. Or all the apostles. Or the entire first century church. That discouragement is part of the is part of the problem. It's one of those difficulties we find out in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 11 that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's what God promises us. And so what we've got to do is we've got to find a way to focus on the promise to such a degree that we can, we can overcome those discouragements. It's not that they don't happen. It's not that they don't discourage. But they don't derail because we're focused on the promise and we're developing a sincere and sustaining faith. Turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. 
that's what we're doing now is we're taking this concept of pressing on and living by faith and we're taking it from a slogan that really doesn't mean anything and we're trying to give it its backbone or see its backbone, understand how it can support us and how it can, it can deliver us through this difficult life. So Hebrews chapter 11, it's the hall of, of the heroes of faith, right? We read about all of these, these faithful men. Hebrews 11 verse 9, by faith, talking about Abraham, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Why? He was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. You go back and study about Abraham. If Abraham wanted to build a city, he could have built a city. I mean, of his own resources, he puts together an army that goes and defeats five kings and rescues Lot. I mean, if he wanted to build a nice place, he could have built a nice place. But that, that wasn't what he was living for. He was living for what God had promised. And so because of that, he was willing to dwell in tents. Drop down verse 13. All these died in faith without having received the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them, welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, verse 15 is the verse to me. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they had went out, they would have had opportunity to return. Abraham could have backed out at any moment. He could have looked at the situation. He could have said, God, you want me to move to Canaan? Where is Canaan? And by the way, it was about as dangerous a thing as you could possibly do to, to relocate the way that Abraham does in Abraham's life. But he does. He gets there. God doesn't hand the place to him. The only land he will ever own in Canaan during his lifetime is the tomb he buys for his wife. And yet he stayed. Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. Where is he? 15 years in, he still doesn't have a son. And so he goes and he finds a way to have a son. And God says, not that son. And he stays. And he still remains faithful. And then you, you keep reading down verse 17. By faith, and, and here we begin to understand what faith does for us. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, that which He also received back as a tithe. Think about that. Abraham's been waiting on this child, this child of promise. He finally gets him. It's Isaac. All of his faith has, has, been, has paid off, right? There's our linear progression way of thinking. He's gone from point A, now he's at point B. He gets the reward, God says. Take your son, the son I promised you, up on that mountain and put him on an altar and sacrifice him. What? What's that, God? Go. How does Abraham climb that mountain with that child? How does he take that young boy and even put him on the altar? How does he raise the knife to strike him? The answer is faith. The Hebrew writer tells us that Abraham reasoned within himself that God could bring Isaac back from the dead. How many resurrections had Abraham seen? As far as the biblical text is concerned, we have no reason to believe he'd ever even seen such a thing. We have no reason to believe that he would have understood such a thing. And yet because God had given him Isaac to begin with from the dead womb, Abraham reasons that that God is powerful enough to restore him from the tomb. And so his faith, and this is the answer we're looking for. What a discouraging moment this could have been in the life of Abraham. You talk about derailing someone's faith. This is the moment that could have done it. But because of his faith, his absolute confidence and insurance in the promise of God, he acts in a way that demonstrates trust. He is faithful. He doesn't fall away. He draws closer to God. Think about that. 
the most challenging moment in his life. And what happens? He draws closer. He draws closer to God. Brethren, it is our faith. Not something we think we know. Not some inexpressible feeling that we have. Not even just something we think we believe. That, that's, not, that, that's not going to do it if that's where your faith is. Discouragement is going to, it's going to cause you some problems, isn't it? No, this active, living, manifested, obedient trust in God, in His power, in His willingness, in His promise, in its fulfillment. When we believe in that and our daily pattern demonstrates our belief in that. When we're convicted of that and everybody who sees us knows that because of how we live our life. We have the kind of faith that can defeat discouragement. But I'm going to have to do something else. I'm going to have to discipline my mind. Years ago, I was going to teach 1 Corinthians and I was reading in Acts and reading along in Acts 18 to get some background information. That's where I'm opening my Bible to right now. Acts Chapter 18, I was looking for some background information as we do when we study a book of the Bible. And this one verse kind of jumped out to me. And it's, it's one of those things that jumped out then. And I can hardly say the word Acts without thinking about this passage from time to time. He says there in Acts chapter 18 and there in verse 9, Paul's come to Corinth. He's been teaching and preaching in the synagogue. He's having some success. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. Do not be afraid any longer. And that verse is just kind of dropped in chapter 18. There's nothing in the first eight verses that tells you Paul was afraid or explains why Paul would be afraid. It just, it just comes out of nowhere. But then if you go back in the context of Acts just a little bit, this starts making all kinds of sense. You go back to Acts chapter 15, as, as Paul and Barnabas are about to start the second missionary journey, they have a disagreement about John Mark who abandoned them during the first journey. Barnabas wants to take him. Paul doesn't. And, and they can't come to a reconciliation. They end up going separate ways. And Barnabas meant a lot to Saul. Barnabas is the one who had stood by Saul when the rest of the church wanted nothing to do with him. Barnabas is the one that goes and gets him and brings him to Antioch. And that leads to him being involved in these missionary journeys to begin with. It's a big moment in Saul's, Paul's life. He goes on and, and he's preaching the Gospel and he gets to Philippi. All he does in Philippi is preach the Gospel of grace. Cast one demon out. Next thing you know, he's arrested and he's being beaten and he's he's in stocks in a Roman prison. We know the story. He's going to be miraculously released. But if you think that made the beating hurt less, what what a terrible thing to do. For simply telling people how they could be saved from their sin. Then he finds himself in this terrible situation. He goes to Thessalonica. Doesn't get better there. The Jews there want to kill him. As a matter of fact, the brethren have to smuggle him out of Thessalonica. But get this. Once he leaves, the problem doesn't stop. And Paul knows that. Because you go read First and Second Thessalonians, and what you find out is that the church there endures severe persecution. I think that might be on Paul's mind a little bit. Everywhere I go, I preach the Gospel. I find myself in prison or beaten, or, or these brand new Christians find themselves being, being, being plagued by the Jews and the Romans. Who's getting discouraged by now? If you're Paul. Who's beginning to ask yourself, is there really value in preaching this gospel the way I've been preaching it? Who's beginning to become afraid of what might happen after the next sermon? I think this was an extremely discouraging time for Paul. And then, by the way, he goes to Athens. And i got to wonder how this impacts Paul. He goes to Athens, and if you read about Paul, Scholars will tell you that Paul was one of the greatest logicians that ever lived. That his use of Greek and Roman and Hebrew rhetoric is unrivaled. 
And when he stood in Athens, which at that time was kind of the, the seat of the intellectual world, but he stood among peers, he wasn't looking up to anybody. And he presents the gospel, and he presents his evidence for the gospel, and his evidence is the resurrection, and some people listen and believe. But most of them just laugh at Paul. And I'm not saying Paul preached. I know Paul didn't preach for the acclaim of men, but that had to hurt. That had to hurt. Here, here's this intellectual test, and, and, and what happens? Well, these great minds just scoff at the truth that Paul is preaching. Beaten everywhere he goes, imprisoned everywhere he goes. Now he's being mocked and, and laughed out. And he gets to Corinth, and by the way, things are already getting a little difficult in Corinth. It's a discouraging time. God comes to him and says, do not be afraid. But that's not all that happens. I, I want you to turn over to 2 Corinthians. There's a passage over here in 2 Corinthians, and it's very interesting how it gets treated by most people. It gets treated this way by most brethren I know. It gets treated this way in just about every commentary I've ever picked up. Paul mentions a problem here, and we immediately stop reading 2 Corinthians and start speculating about the problem. And we come up with a, a variety of answers as a result. I, I want to talk about this problem, but I want to stay in 2 Corinthians and let the context guide us a little bit, the way we do you know, the rest of the Bible. I want to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and I want you to think about what Paul is enduring here. You know the passage as well as I do, beginning there in verse 24. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked at night. The day I spent in the deep. Been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the cities, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure of me of concern for all the churches. I get tired of reading that. How, how discouraging could it have been? How, how, how easy would it have been for Paul to lay on his bed at night, which I'm sure was very comfortable, and start recounting all these things in his head. And somewhere along the line, the story becomes, because I've been serving Christ, these things have happened. And just keep recounting and recounting and recounting and recounting nightly as he lays on his bed until he just no longer has the urge or the desire to get up and preach the Gospel. I think it would have been a pretty easy thing to have. You ever wonder what Paul ended up looking like? You know, you read some of the things that Paul says and you kind of begin to picture this this very robust man, this man who could kind of command an audience. <laughs> Maybe he was at one point. How many of these Roman beatings do you think a man has to have before he can't stand up straight? How many times do you think you get stoned and left for dead until you're walking with a pretty pronounced limp? Until you have pains that just don't go away? How easy would it have been for Paul to be standing in a pulpit preaching to people hunched over and in pain, people scoffing him, Jews lining up over here to imprison him before he said, you know, <laughs> maybe I'll retire. That's not what he does. Why not? Well, he had the kind of faith we've been talking about this morning, but I, I want you to look at chapter 12. So I think this is a lot of what chapter 12 says. He starts off recounting this vision he has of heaven. Again, he lived by promise, just as you and I, just as Abraham. But verse 7, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me, and he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. 
Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So here's what we do with this passage. We get to that phrase, thorn in the flesh. We look up from our Bibles and we start talking about bad eyesight. I think that's probably the most popular one among our brethren. You do see the connection in verse 10 to that list of trials in verse 11, don't you? Did Paul have bad eyesight? Sounds like it. He had to get somebody else to write several of his letters. He talks about his bad eyesight. Is that what he's talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? Well, he sure doesn't mention it. I know what he does mention. Difficulties and trials and persecutions. The very thing that's in the context that led up to this context. What if this is what Paul's saying? I, I was a day and a night in the deep. And, and finally I get my broken arthritic body out of the cold water. And I got to go preach again the next day. And I prayed to God. God, don't let this happen to me again. God, I get the whole trial thing now. <laughs> I, I don't think you've got to teach me that lesson anymore. Can you let it go? God, can I just have peace and safety? And God does the thing that we hate for God. God does the thing that I think for so many of us ends up being, being our excuse for allowing our faith to wane. God says, no. No. Paul's going to be in prison the rest of his life. Paul, Paul, Paul's going to endure probably a very, a very painful death as a result of his faith. What did Paul choose to do Remember, this is, this is a test of faith. This is a great test of faith is what Abraham endured as he put Isaac on that, on that altar. But here's what Paul does. He takes God's answer and he says there in verse 10, Therefore I am well content with weaknesses, insults, distresses, persecutions, and difficulties. Why? For Christ's sake. I think that tells us what Paul, what Paul recited when he laid on his bed at night. It wasn't the numerous wounds he had to have, the many aches and pains that had to plague him. It wasn't how many times he was beaten or stoned or imprisoned or shipwrecked or out in the deep or without food. That wasn't what he thought about at night. He disciplined his mind. He thought about his Lord. He thought about how he could serve Him. He thought about what he could do for his people. He thought about what he could say to encourage others to obey the Gospel. He thought about how he could go to churches and build them up. He thought about what he could write even while in prison, by the way, in Philippi. So that fussing brethren could be brought together. These are the things that consume Paul's mind. Why? Because he chose to. Because he chose to. Brethren, you and I can do the same Thing. You and I are, are capable of, of this exact same choice. Paul's troubles did not stop. That's not what the Lord did for him. Instead, what we see is the Lord tells him what his purpose is. He's told us too, by the way, to serve him, to serve the church, to teach the gospel. The very same things Paul's doing, by the way. And Paul then chooses to focus his mind on that. And brother, we can do the same thing. Look at Philippians chapter 4. This is what he's telling us in Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. There's two sisters in this church, and they're squabbling with each other, and it has apparently become so intense that the Apostle Paul has to write this church so that they can deal with this squabble. I love how we read this letter and say Philippi had no problems. That's not what Paul said. They had a big one. They had the kind of problem that can absolutely and utterly destroy a fellowship. What are you going to do about it? I know what we do sometimes. We go home and we fret. That's not what Paul said, dude. 
Paul said, make up your mind to think about those things that are helpful. Verse 8, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, in, if anything worthy of praise, listen to this, dwell on these things. I say discipline your mind. If you say cliche, you're not arguing with me. You're arguing with the man who spent the day and the night in the deep. You're arguing with the man who had been beaten numerous times, who had been scourged, who had been stoned, who had, who had endured about everything a man can endure in order to preach the Gospel, and he dwelt on these things. He disciplined his mind, and it allowed him to press on in faith, and as a result, he's the man we know as the Apostle Paul. Brother, we can do the same thing. I'll move through this quickly. It's a, it's a pretty quick point in there. We need to find the right people to be around. Go back to Acts chapter 15. I, you know, we, we talked about this disagreement that Paul has with Barnabas over John Mark. It was certainly a moment that was discouraging to Paul. There's no doubt that that is the case. But what does Paul do? The very next section of Scripture, he finds Silas. And he goes to preach the gospel with Silas. The first place they stop, he finds Timothy. The rest of the Pauline letters are going to tell us about these two men. They're going to be mentioned again and again because of the way they encouraged Paul and they encouraged the brethren and for their faithful service. Paul did not sit and stew. Instead, what he did is he surrounded himself with those who lifted him up in his service to God. Brethren, we can do that too. You know, when a, when a brother or sister in Christ falls to sin and discourages us, we've got a choice. We can follow them. We, we can kind of sit in the mire. Or we can look around this building and say, you know, there's other Christians here. I want to lift them up and I want them to lift me up. And I'm going to reach out and they're going to reach out. And, and we're, going to, we're going to hold on to each other and we're going to help each other on this road to heaven. And brother, if we're not going to do that, I don't know why we build the building. I, I, don't, I don't know why God created the local church if that's not what we're going to do. What Paul could have done, but faith prevented him from doing, he could have made the situation all about himself. But he never does that. He never does that. He could have become bitter. He never does that. Instead, what you find is Paul writing encouraging words about John Mark. Think about how hard that had to be. But there's a choice that Paul makes somewhere along there. Not to hold this against this man. Not to change how he views him forever. But to give him the opportunity to grow. He could have been absolutely derailed in his service to God. But that's not what Paul did. Instead, he sought out those who could lift him up. One of those questions we've got to ask of ourselves. And I think this is the kind of question we've got to ask often. What's important? Galatians chapter 2, Paul rebukes Peter. He rebukes Peter for his, his hypocritical actions. And he does so in a very straightforward way. He could have destroyed whatever relationship they might have had, but Paul said it was worth it. Why? Because Peter was undoing the very work of preaching God. With Paul, there was a, a pretty clear priority order. The gospel comes first. The gospel comes first. What about in our lives? Where does the gospel come? Where does our service to God come? Where does our, our drive for this promise, where does that rank in our, our, our list of things that we think are priorities? Is it somewhere below friendships and family? Is it somewhere below personal call? If the honest answer to any of those is yes, it's not discouraging that it's going to be wrong. It's not on the tracks to start. But I think it's the most important thing in our lives. To serve our God. 
and spread his gospel. What roadblock could ever stop us? God made a nation from a dead woman. Through whom he brought his son to become the answer for sin. Paul took a Pharisee to persecute, or God took a Pharisee to persecute the church. And turned him into the most prolific writer we have in our New Testament. <coughs> Who tells us about the power of the blood of Jesus Christ? Who tells us about the grace that He has shed upon us? And who has lived a life that shows us that we can suffer more than we That our reward is in heaven. If you're here this morning and you're not a child of God, where is your focus? Where is your reward? If you are a child of God and yet you stray, maybe discouragement's got you. You're going to stay there living in sin, separated from your God. You can make excuses if you want to, but that's where you are. Or you're going to come to your Lord and pray. We can help you in any way, listen, and love you.